uh, some evidences of the Holy Spirit. Did you guys have any, have any time to think about this question throughout the week? You mean two weeks? <laughs> two weeks, yes, because last week was canceled. Nice catch. Um, speaking in tongues. Okay. Anything else? Prophecies. Okay. Miracles. Okay. Um, Is there anything else saved? to do it? People getting saved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, even us connecting closer to God. Okay. Good answers. Anything else? Uh, people having courage to witness. Okay. You know. Let me ask it a different way. What are some evidences of the Holy Spirit moving in an individual, in a person? Uh, the way we walk with Christ. Okay. Can you explain a little bit? Um, we're not how the world walks with Christ. Like, what do you mean? Um, I think we... I, I don't want to say to distinguish right from wrong better, but... I think we have more of, um, <coughs> what's the word I'm looking for, um, of guidance okay. of everyday life. Okay. All right. Anything else? You should see the fruit of the Spirit in people's lives. Mm -hmm, okay, so what are some of those? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Okay. And I think that that kind of leads us right into um, this. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to overlook what the things that uh, Diana and Gracie were saying at first. Those are definitely evidence of the Holy Spirit moving. Um, you know, first off, people being saved. Right. You know, you see a lot of people, you know, claim that the Holy Spirit is moving, especially on like the TV evangelists and stuff, where, you know, um, people being slain. Do what? I got goosebumps. Yeah, I, I got goosebumps. People being slain in the Spirit, all this different stuff. But then you don't actually see a lasting change in the person. Right. See what I mean? And 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 with the Holy Spirit, you have to always ask. Is this somebody's emotions or is this the Holy Spirit? Because a lot of times people will just get their eyes on, on what they're going on. And you know, the thing is, this isn't something that's new. This is something that John talks about uh, in First John, which was written in the 90s. Uh, it's something that uh, Paul talks about uh, in First Corinthians, for one, which was written in the 50s. So, you know, this is something that, that if Jesus was uh, resurrected and ascended in, in the 30s, you can see it really didn't take that long before the Holy Spirit, you know, was, was starting to, people were starting to misuse the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit was doing anything wrong. Um, and the first thing I want to look at is Galatians 5, uh, 16 through 25. Okay. Galatians 5, 16 through 25. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, notice how in this section he contrasts the two things, spirit and flesh. Now, this is not what he's saying. He is not saying that our bodies are, are inherently evil and that our spirits are inherently good. Because that's what the Gnostics started teaching, that we are basically two, two people. We have a spiritual man and a physical man, right? And the spiritual man is always good. Everything spiritual is good. And everything physical is bad. That's not what he's saying at all. He is contrasting the Holy Spirit and the works of the Holy Spirit, okay, with the works of the flesh, okay? Basically, people who are not saved, right, with the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Okay? Uh, that, that always needs to be clarified because there's always that one person who tries to take this out of context and start teaching that, you know, my spirit's winning, but my flesh is, you know, and it's like, well, I, you're you're one person, though. Mm -hmm. You're one person. You're made up of different parts, but you are one person. And in the end, God will also resurrect our 
fleshly man is the same as he's resurrecting our spiritual man. Okay? Same as Jesus was resurrected, resurrected in the physical body, we will be resurrected in the physical body. And all kinds of weird doctrines have been going on, so I, you kind of have to watch these things. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Now this is really no, no, uh, no surprise here. Basically, the things of God are in contrast to the things of man, to the things of the world. I mean, this was, this was the case even from Adam and Eve. Man decided to sin against God. God didn't make him sin. He decided to sin against God. And from then on out, man has a sinful nature. You see the, you see the steady decline from the days of Adam and Eve all the way to Abraham, right? You see people continually getting worse and worse until God has to send a flood. They get worse and worse again until they build the Tower of Babel. You, you see them always choosing their own way. You see that the flesh is set against the spirit. See what I mean? And uh, so... And it is the Holy Spirit who desires for us to do um, to be holy. Okay, not obviously God desires, but I mean it's the Holy Spirit who is causing that causing that rest, restoring process. Okay, make sense. So for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident: sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Um, so the first thing, before we go any further, it needs to be established that this is not an exhaustive list. He even and says it there in his own words. Things like these. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then also we can deduce a few things from this list. First off, he's showing us the kinds of things that, that, that are of the world. And we can see the things that are righteous by looking at the things that are bad. For instance, um, now the works of – oh, first off, let's start in verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So basically, people who are not free in Christ don't have the Holy Spirit working in them, and they are still bound under the law, right? Which means they are still a sinner because nobody can, nobody can be per perfected in the law, right? But they're still held to the standard of right and wrong. However, if you've been saved, right, the Holy Spirit has been has, is washing you, right, and you are being saved even as you are saved, right, and he's doing work in you, he's changing you, he's bringing you somewhere new, and you're no longer bound by the law because the Holy Spirit is cleansing you as Jesus Christ is standing in for you. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um. Now in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality, impurity. So then we can know if impurity is the work of the world, we can know that the work of the spirit would be purity, right? Right. See what I mean? You can see some things that are godly by simply working and seeing that it's the opposite of the way that the world does it. Not, don't get carried away with that. I'm just, you know, please don't get carried away with that. Um, idolatry, sorcery. Enmity, strife, jealousy. He actually mentions this in Romans chapter one, where he says they worship the creator rather than the, uh, the created rather than the creator. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And that's basically what he said right here: uh, idolatry, sorcery, uh, enmity and strife, uh, jealousy and fits of anger. Those things all kind of go together. Rivalries, dissensions and divisions. People quarreling among themselves. So we know that if a church is claiming to be the Holy Spirit, but there's people who are getting in tiffs about the Holy Spirit. Probably isn't actually the Holy Spirit, is it? Right? Because the Holy Spirit isn't going to lead people into further debate amongst themselves. He's not going to lead them into further problems with each other. He is going to lead them into peacemaking. He's going to lead them into proper doctrine. He's going to lead them into not doing things their own way, but uniting together and saying, hey, it's not I have the gift of prophecy. It's we need to be using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? And you can tell the attitude of a false prophet because a false prophet, Pastor's been talking about this a lot. If you really want a full, a full in-depth on it, just go back, I don't know, seven months on Wednesday nights and just go forward from there. Um, actually, it's probably been longer than that. It's been a while. Anyways, um, one of the things about a false prophet is that they, they always um, exalt themselves over, over others and over the Lord. It's always themselves, right? So you'll see false prophets say, like, say something like this. I have the gift of prophecy. Emphasis on I, right? Um, I am, I, I am used in, in, the gift, in the gift of healing, and we'll talk about that, the gift of healing. We'll talk about that um, probably next week. Uh, you know, and the emphasis is really on themselves. You know, the Lord revealed it to me that you need to do this. Well, 
Oh, okay. I, I get what you're saying, but here's the thing, though. God usually doesn't just lay something on somebody that he hasn't been working on them at all. You know what I mean? Let me give you guys an example. Gracie, the Lord told me that you need to, you know, stop doing whatever, right? Well, here's the thing, though. Has God been speaking to your heart? Is this something that's going to catch you off guard? Gracie, uh, the Lord told me that you need to leave your husband and go to China as a missionary. Okay, calm down. What? Okay. Didn't the Bible say that God hates divorce? Didn't the Bible say that, that married people are supposed to be submitted to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't it say that? So, I mean, it doesn't really go with the rest of Scripture, does it? Right. So you got to kind of watch these things. Um, because some things, they'll seem right, but they really aren't right. And we kind of talked about this a little bit on sun last Sunday morning, but there's the idea of, of, you know, that sounds good. It has to be good, right? And, and that's just not the way it is. So in verse 21, envy, drunkenness, uh, orgies, and, and, and once again... The Bible doesn't talk about things like marijuana and stuff, okay? But it does talk about us being sober-minded. It does talk about us not becoming a slave to things. Right. It does talk about us being wise with our money. It does talk about us obeying the law. It doesn't – see what I mean? And so we really need to be on, on guard with this kind of stuff because although the Bible doesn't use the word marijuana not once, it says things that should encourage us to think twice before we partake or choose not to partake. Right. Okay? Like I said this a hundred times. I don't think that there's anything wrong with the Christian drinking, honestly. But here's the thing. In my situation, I don't think it's right for many reasons, and I'll, I'll list them in order of importance, really. First off, I'm a pastor, and I don't think that pastors should be equated with those kinds of things, especially in a congregation like this. Mm -hmm. This community is very much drawn to alcoholism, and I don't think that it's right for a pastor to, to encourage that. I can't say, hey, you should stop being an alcoholic when I, myself, am drinking. Yeah. Saying enough, I think that in all things... Balance is more important than the law because we're free from the law anyways, right? So I can drink, right? I'm free to drink, right? But I probably shouldn't get drunk, should I? I should probably should be wise with, can I afford this? See what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I was going to start going down a list, but I think I'll go ahead and stop there because you kind of get, get what I'm saying. Wisdom over whether it's right or wrong, is it foolish or wise? See? Um, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that brings me to the next point. He's not talking about struggles. He's not talking about ha about struggling with something in your life, okay? Because there will always be those things that come up in your life that you struggle with, okay? Be they fits of anger. Be they drunkenness. Be they, you know what I mean, uh, pornography or other sexual, sexual uh, immoralities like adultery or other things. He's not talking about struggles, okay? Now, granted, if you are cheating on your spouse, that's probably something that needs to be addressed sooner than later. <laughs> um, just going out on that. You don't have to cheat on your wife. Just, I feel like I said that wrong, but I think you guys know what I'm saying. Um, he's talking, and obviously no one is perfect, but he's talking about um, people who openly practice these things, people who choose these things, okay? Not struggling, people who are choosing these things. Um, and these kinds of people will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, they're not saved, and in the end, they won't be saved. Basically, is what he's saying, just in case we're all, make sure we're all on the same page here. Then in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, what that means, fruit, the the um, the crop of the Spirit, the produce of the Spirit, the, the thing that is produced by the Spirit. Okay? Oftentimes, I, I grew up in the church hearing the fruit of the Spirit, and I just got lost, you know, fruit of the Spirit. Well, it's not actually the fruit of the Spirit. It's saying, you could say, uh, the effects of the Spirit. It's the same meaning. The Holy Spirit brings about something. What does the Holy Spirit bring about? This. It brings about love. Okay? And we're not talking about, we're not talking about lust, or we're not talking about, you know, that kind of thing. We're talking about love, which is service, pouring out yourself to someone else, right? Putting someone else before yourself, that kind of stuff, right? Um, joy, and we're, once again, we're not talking about being distracted from, from a problem. We're not talking about a temporary happiness. We're talking about an inner joy, right? Uh, peace, patience, that when you deal with people, you deal with them patiently, right? You don't just hop down their throat on stuff. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You don't just abandon people and run off on things. Faithfulness, right? Gentleness, self-control. When you're dealing with somebody... You don't just chew them out and let them let them let them hear it and everything because that's not gentleness, is it? 
Gentleness makes wisdom acceptable to the person that you're telling it to, right? Okay. And then the last thing there that I mentioned is self-control. Basically, um, the Holy Spirit allows us to be allows us to. Why am I trying to say this? I'll give you examples instead of because I can't figure out how to say it, so I'm just going to give you examples. Um, whereas when we are of the world, we throw fits of fits of anger, right? Where we we get lost in our in our anger. Ah, oh, we punch walls and you know we we punch people. And the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome that, to where we have self control over that, right? Whereas the world says, I just had to give them a piece of my mind. The Holy Spirit says, ah, 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 ah. close your mouth. Right. See what I mean? The Holy Spirit gives us that ability to have self-control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, obviously I could say more, but I'm trying to make this easier to understand, not harder to understand, so I think I'm just going to leave it there. Against such things there is no law. And what he means by that is that the law is, is established to show people right and wrong. It's established to show people... Um, their need for salvation and stuff, but there is no there is no law against these things. They're in a sense free from the law. For instance, um, love. The, the serving others isn't isn't wrong. It's a good thing. There's no law binding it. Do you know what I mean? Um, self control. There's no law saying that you have to lose your temper. Is there? Do you know what I mean? The law is for those people who are not under the spirit. They're under the flesh. Do you know what I mean? Because to show them, in fact, Galatians, earlier in Galatians, it talks about this. The law is for those immoral people, to show them their immorality. But for people who are under the Spirit, they're no longer bound by the law. They're bound by the Spirit, which is the law of love. So therefore, these things of the Spirit have no law against them. Does that make sense? Because the law was not based on the Spirit. The law was based on the flesh. Right? Right? Okay. And also, man was not made for the law. The law was made for man. Does that make sense? We were not created in life to follow the law. Right? The law was created for us to help us back to God. Right? People get a little bit confused on that one. You know, the law wasn't created as an end in and of itself. Right? So, uh, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. And he talks about elsewhere how it, how it's a, a thing of, of, of uh, ongoing process, but I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. So the things there, the peace, the patience, the gentleness, the self-control, these are these are the things that, that are the evidence of the Holy Spirit having been moved in somebody, right? And this is not a one-and-done thing, is it? This is an ongoing process. The Holy Spirit is working in us, right? Uh, Paul says it elsewhere. They're really going at it tonight. Paul says elsewhere about um, – that really – Distracted me. Like, oh, I hate obnoxious engines like that, and people just. It's like it's six o'clock at night. Do you guys? And you're seven o'clock at night. Do you guys not have families? Goodness sakes. Uh, look at that. You can still hear them revving up their engines. It's like, go away. There's plenty of countryside for you guys to rev your engines at. Goodness sakes. What was I even talking about? What was I talking about, guys? You guys know? Because I kind of lost my train of thought. I have a feeling it was about something. It was it about was something. something. That's for sure. <laughs> <clears throat> Paul says elsewhere about... Oh, yes. How he, he who began a good work in us is faithful and just to continue it and to... Uh, he, I forget the way he says it, but basically to to, to continue it until, that, until the time of our resurrection. Um... Any questions on that part? Because next week we're going to start looking at the gifts of the Spirit, and they're going to be harder to understand if you don't understand what we're saying this week. Um, next up, what does the Holy Spirit do? And there's a long list here, so really, if you if you have a question or if you have an idea, just go ahead and spit it out. We'll talk about it. He convicts people of their sin. Okay. All right. Anything else? He reveals the word of God to us. Okay, what do you mean by that? Like, helps us to understand it. Okay. And by word of God, you mean the Bible, or you the mean... The Bible. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? He comforts us. Okay. 
helps us with discernment. Okay, what do you mean by discernment? Like, um, someone comes up to you and is telling you about the Bible and telling you about different verses and then something just like, mm. doesn't sound right. <laughs> you know, the discernment and, and what's right and wrong in the, with the... Okay. Um, I do think that it needs to be noted, though, that there's a difference between discernment and not liking the person who's talking. So, any other any other ideas? He gives us the words that we need to say. Okay. We need to witness to people. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? He gives us strength. Okay, what do you mean by strength? Um, someone passes away and, and we don't feel like we can go on and kind of give us the strength to keep going. Okay. So basically like a spiritual encouragement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, keep thinking about that. If you guys have anything, you can just stop me. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, the renewal that, that the Holy Spirit does. Um, Isaiah 32. And I don't want you guys to do this. <laughs> I don't want you guys to hear this and see these as completely unrelated things. These things are connected. Okay. And they're not like, this is something the Holy Spirit does, this is something the Holy Spirit does, and then this is something the Holy Spirit does. This is what the Holy Spirit does, okay? And renewal is something that's going to happen even in his conviction. See what I mean? When God is, con when the Holy Spirit is convicting you and drawing to, trying to draw you in, he's doing it for the sake of renewal. See what I mean? These are not disconnected things. These are interconnected things. Does that make sense? Isaiah 32, uh, verse 14. For the palace is forsaken, the populous city deserted, the hill and the watchtower will become dens forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. Verse 15. Until the Spirit is poured, out, poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a, a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be <coughs> peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation and secure dwellings and in quiet resting place, um, places. Now this is one of those things already and not yet. This is already fulfilled in part and is fulfilled as people are filled with the Holy Spirit, but is not fully uh, fulfilled until the end. Okay. So let's look at some of these things. First off, um, he talked about in verse 14 just the, the idea of desolation. Right? There's a populous city that's deserted. Right? Where, where, where life was once was, there's nothingness, right? But then in 15, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness, the wilderness is something that's uninhabitable, right? Just, you know, barren dunes and, and grass and dust and whatnot, right? Um, where is it? Becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. So where once there was nothing, complete new life and growth, okay? Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, okay? And the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation and secure dwellings. Basically, he's talking about the way that the Holy Spirit will bring renewal in your spirit. He will bring you to peace in your spirit, right? He'll give you comfort, and, and right? You guys are all looking at me. Do you guys hear what I'm saying here? Because I can explain it differently if you have questions, okay? Um, the Holy Spirit brings change and growth. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now, on some of these, I had to just pick and choose what verses to, to, to include because they were like just oodles of, of verses. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says here, 
And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit is causing that work from glory to glory, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome, cool. Um, and one of the things is, that's this is really the great tester of whether it is the Holy Spirit or not. Because the Holy Spirit uh, works in us. He changes in us, right? He, he, he does something, right? He... he, he he builds a well where there was once nothing, right? Isn't that what Isaiah was talking about? That renewal process that happens? So that's actually one of the main tests of the Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit moves, people don't just go about their business unless they were just kind of going along with it, but they weren't actually I mean, seeking after the Holy Spirit. So, um, and also I want to point out right here because this is as good as place of any. The Holy Spirit will act differently with different people, and the and the reason why is because if you seek so if you seek God a little bit, the Holy Spirit's only going to respond a little bit. If you submit yourself, if you humble yourself, if you seek the Holy Spirit, He'll move a lot bit. Does that make sense? And so the Holy Spirit will really respond to how you seek Him. So if you want more of the Holy Spirit, you have to seek more of the Holy Spirit. And those who seek little will receive little, and those who seek much will get much. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And when the and when you've got something uh, that you're kind of holding back from, from the Lord, the Holy Spirit is very sensitive to that, and He will also hold back. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're if you're wanting to be used in more of the Holy Spirit, if you're wanting more of the Holy Spirit in your life for comfort and stuff like that, and you're holding back part of yourself, uh, you're not really seeking with a full heart. You 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 see what I mean? You, you you like we talked about last Sunday. You're doing things like reading your horoscopes and all these other nonsense things. The Holy Spirit will also respond to that, and, and you are not going to encounter him in the same way as other people. Does that make sense? So, um, another thing that he does is revelation, which I think is what, what uh, exactly what Chuck was talking about. Uh, St. Peter 1.20. Because <clears throat> he gave us the Bible through revelation. Okay, He revealed it to people, prophets and whatnot, right? So... Then that brings us to St. Peter 1, 20-21, which says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Basically, no, there's no such thing as a self-proclaimed prophet. Either somebody pr pretends to be a prophet, and they're not really prophets, and they're just saying something. Or, someone is moved upon by the Holy Spirit to prophesy, and they do prophesy. And we'll talk about this next week. But prophecy isn't just telling the future, okay? We'll look at this next week, but that's not just all of it is. And verse 21 says this, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but, man's, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we know that Isaiah, right, was moved by the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah, moved by the Holy Spirit. Moses, moved by the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is something we already looked at in Numbers, when the Holy Spirit, which was on him, was also given to the 70 elders. In Joshua, at the end of Deuteronomy, Joshua area, where the Holy Spirit is also taken from, not taken from Moses, but it's also given to Joshua. Remember we talked about that? So, uh, what did you notice? Yeah, I couldn't Hi. believe she said that. I was like, you what? <laughs> you, you what? Because I, I know I was, if, if my kidneys had not have already failed, they would have failed because of that. <laughs> Okay, well, that's something. I guess we're just going to keep going. What happens? Is it still recording? I don't know. I guess I could try stopping it, and then then I could just restart it. Like on another recording, there'd just be two parts. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, because if, you're, if, if you don't know if it's, if it's stopped, that means you lost the second part. You better be safe then. Yeah. Ben, give me a direction. Let it go? Don't stop it? Okay, but as it is, now if we put this up, there's going to be like a 15-minute gap of just awkward sounds. <laughs> no, it, 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 it shouldn't have picked that anything up. So I'm making it awkward right now by yes. talking about the awkward yeah. part. Okay. Yeah, you should just continue. Okay. Well, i got to get it to extend back onto the monitor then. Hold on. Can't you edit it? Um, do what? Can't you edit the audio? Uh. <laughs> oh, no, I have a free program.
I don't know if I can do that. Oh. Okay, cool. Um, okay, and so then another thing that the Holy Spirit does is teaches us scripture, right? As we study the word, mm -hmm. he helps it to make sense to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then, um, I mean, since he's the one who inspired it. You ought to know what it says. You ought to know All what right. it says. <laughs> um, uh, but also, another word of warning on that, the Holy Spirit will put in as much as you put in in this area. Mm. If you don't study the word, you can't really expect for the Holy Spirit to just give you all this enlightenment about what the Bible says because you're not in the Word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yeah. And once again, I don't want to make it sound like we do equal parts with God. I don't want to make it sound like that at all. The Holy Spirit is going to pour goodness on you because he that's just who God is. And I can't explain it. I can't foresee what God's going to do in the future and what He isn't going to do. Okay. God is not predictable. However... You can guarantee that when you seek after the Lord, no matter what He is blessing you with, He does. He likes blessing people, and so He's just going to bless you more. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. So if you really want, really want to get, really want to understand the Word, seek the Lord in prayer, and read the Word, and eventually the Holy Spirit will just speak something to you. See what I mean? And it'll start making more sense. Um, well, that's one of the things that I see people do. They get saved, and then I tried reading the Bible; it was confusing, so I stopped. Well, then you're never going to understand it. Um, so, kind of lost my train of thought on this. I hope that's all I was going to say, guys. <clears throat> Another thing that he does is guides us as a church, as individuals. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 30. Today I was thinking about how funny it would be to record a video for my funeral. Be like, hey guys, this is young Michael. Uh, don't get old, as you can see. When you get old, you die. This is young Michael speaking, and I can tell you, I didn't die, and that guy did. <laughs> just thought it'd be funny if like, the, you have this whole like <laughs> routine, and people are just watching, like, we're supposed okay. to be sad. <laughs> Anyways, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. Uh Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, who make uh, and who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. See, basically what they were doing is not inquiring of the Lord as to what they should do, and yet they were his people, but yet they were just, this seems like a good idea to do. See what I mean? And so that's something not only God does do, God wants to do. God's not one of those uh, parents who are too busy for you. You know what I mean? He's one of those people who wants you to seek after him. But I did seek after him, and he was quiet, and he didn't answer. Once again, though, God's not really on our time frame. So when that happens, maybe you're asking the wrong question, or maybe you're just not listening. Right. So stop for a second. In fact, I think Chuck just talked about this last Sunday night. Stop for a second and just see if there's something God's trying to teach you and continue in prayer while you're doing that too. If you'd have missed out on Sunday night, last Sunday night, I would highly encourage you to go back and listen to it. Uh, ben can make you a copy of the CD, and I actually think it's online right now anyways. Um, yeah, so if you just go to the church's Facebook, I think it's there. It's probably on Chuck's uh, Facebook now too because usually when Ben uploads it, he shares it onto the person's uh, Facebook. Anyways, uh, so the Holy Spirit guides us. Uh, there, there's uh, lots of other things that the Holy Spirit does, and, and so I didn't really have time to, to go through all of it because literally we'd be here for weeks just talking about all the things the Holy Spirit does. Okay. And uh, we're going to talk about this in just a second, how people have reduced with the work of the Holy Spirit. But one of the big things that the Holy Spirit does is his work in creation. Right? The Holy Spirit gives life. He does so spiritually and it does so physically. By by what was Jesus born of the Virgin Mary? By, by the spirit. by the power of the Spirit. Uh -huh. By what was the world created? By the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh -huh. Right. Jesus <coughs> created the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? The Holy Spirit is involved with life. He sustains things right. in the world. 
uh, he sustains the breath uh, in our lungs. He uh, he al he also keeps the planets in motion. He keeps things right. He create he creates and he, and he gives life and whatnot, right? But then also he's involved in these other things like oh I don't know working in us. You know what I mean? So uh, he assures, he teaches, he comforts. That, I mean honestly the things the things that people have written dozens of books on you know. But the bad thing is about those dozens of books. Only a handful of them are good because the other handful just – they go to weird places. Um, something about the work of the Holy Spirit just – I don't know. I don't want to say it tracks. It does. Though. But it draws out some weird people, man. And I'm not blaming it on the Holy Spirit. I'm blaming it on weird people, man. Right. Weird people. Weird people. Golly. And we're going to try to look at some of these weird things and why they are weird and how they're not biblical. And I will do my best, but I might forget some things. So if you do have a specific question about something, you can put it in the question box. I'll make sure to address it. Uh, Romans 8.16, uh, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. What? Oh, I thought somebody asked a question. Um, John 14.26, Was it about the husband? Oh. I apparently stayed at a resort and not eligible for Well, there's this one that's like one of those automated things, you know? Uh -huh. And it's this woman and she's like, hello? And you're like, hello? And she's like, hello? And you're like, hello? And she's like, oh, sorry, I was talking to my husband. Anyway, my name is blah, 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 blah. Huh, it's weird. John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I know we focus a lot on the last part, bring to remembrance, but that, that first part is actually pretty important too. He will teach you all things. Okay. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 is the last. We're going to look at this, at this part. But really, the work of the Holy Spirit is, is very extensive. You can see it throughout a lot of the books of the Bible. Um, 2.12 says this Now we have received not the spirit of the world But the spirit who is from God That we might understand the things freely given, given us by God So it gives us that understanding um, And then another thing that he does Is gives unity Grace, would you mind shutting the door? I think that's going to be picked up on the microphone. People evidently like to own pets, but don't like to get them to shut up. Right. Because <sighs> everybody likes hearing their neighbor's dog just go at it all night. <laughs> it's like when we lived in California. There, were, Everybody had cats in California. Kind of like here, except California's way bigger, so more cats. And uh, the cats would literally go at it by our windows. Jeez. Literally go at it. We're not talking about fighting here, although some of that too. Yeah. Try You'd going to sleep. Than be fighting. Do what? You'd rather than. I'd be rather fighting. than be fighting. With the noises they make. Yeah, and trying to go to sleep with that is like. Uh. <laughs> <sighs> Acts chapter two verse sixteen uh, through eighteen. Yes. Um, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be God. De um, it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will, shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on male, my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Notice the quality that's happening here. Um, first off, it's given to everyone. Okay. Notice the, also that everybody is being used. You know, there wasn't like a certain group that God was overlooking. God wants to use people. Um, 44 through 47. Uh, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So once again, we see the now. This isn't telling us to sell all of our sell all of our possessions. Okay. 
This is not instructing, it is recording. And uh, if you notice there, just the work of the Holy Spirit was enabling them to do all these different things. So then in Galatians 5.20, um, we already looked at this once. I want to give special attention to this one verse. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, and the things of the, of the uh, flesh. Okay, so Saint Corinthians three thirteen fourteen. Saint Corinthians thirteen fourteen. I know it's somewhere. There it is. Found it. Uh, the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's the last verse of 2 Corinthians, and I think sometimes we skip past that part. So, um, Let's go to the next thing here. Uh, I do want to give a word of warning. Right? Bam! A word of warning. See how I did that? Um, there's kind of this idea in the church that goes to two different extent extremes. And Pastor and I have talked about this. It's the idea that it's all about Jesus. Literally, the Holy Spirit is only going to say things that lift up Jesus. But that's not true. The Holy Spirit has often done, done things that exalted himself. Right? Mm -hmm. He worked in, for instance, in, in Numbers. Right? The Holy Spirit showed himself and revealed himself with Moses and then did so on the 70 elders or leaders. Did that glorify Jesus? Not directly. It glorified God, right? But there wasn't like that distinction. And what I'm war warning against here is what we've made God into three separate entities. Mm -hmm. The Father is the one from the Old Testament. Nobody cares about him because he's mean. Then the Holy Spirit, he's the weird one. <laughs> So we got to watch out for him. And then there's Jesus. And Jesus is the most important one because that's what salvation is all about. And so we just need to get rid of the other two trinities. See what I mean? And what we've done is we've made three different gods. And we need to be extremely careful about this, guys, because there aren't three different gods. There is one God. Okay? So let's look at this. First off, who was the one whose idea it was to send Jesus? The Father. Mm hmm who is the one that works sanctification in us after Jesus has come? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. So who is involved in salvation? God. Do you understand that? Right. God is involved in our salvation. Okay. So we need to make sure that we're not making false separations between God that don't exist. Okay. But with that being said... How to say this because there's a lot of different I'm trying to attack this from a lot of different angles in our church pastor will frequently say it's all about Jesus he is not meaning it in the way that I just said not to say it in okay he is saying it more like this that there are some weird groups of people out there who use the whole Holy Spirit thing as we don't need Jesus and we're just gonna give ourselves these dreams I saw angels and did you and nobody's being glorified right God has not been glorified through the process. They're just saying all these weird things and claiming it to be of the Holy Spirit. Handling snakes, right? <laughs> Drinking poison. Because why not? <laughs> See what I mean? Because yeah. why not? And that, that's what pastor's talking about. So I'm not contradicting what pastor said, okay? I'm just warning against some, some ideas, and pastor and I have talked about this, some ideas that some people have thought that pastor was talking about, that he was not talking about, okay? So... I am trying to move forward carefully without trying to contradict pastor, but also trying to give um, clarity to those people who are not quite understanding what pastor is teaching them. Okay? So if you still have questions about this, please ask. Okay? So I will try to proceed slowly here. There are not three gods but one. I already said that. Okay? So then the next thing, the Father and Holy Spirit are involved as much as Jesus is. Okay? God loves us. Right? There's not a different God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's the same God. There is just more revelation of Jesus in the New Testament 
than there was necessarily of the Old Testament. Not that Jesus didn't reveal himself in the Old Testament. We just didn't realize that Jesus was revealing himself in the Old Testament. Right? Okay. So, that being said, let's plow ahead here. If one member of the Trinity is overemphasized, the church will always suffer. So what people have done is they've gone to two extremes. I don't need the Holy Spirit because his only purpose, his only purpose was to glorify Jesus. But if I glorify Jesus myself, I don't need the Holy Spirit to do so. In other words, the Holy Spirit is obsolete for the church as long as we have Jesus. Once again, that's putting a distinction there that doesn't need to exist. God, we need God in our church because the church is about God. And the church is a package deal that includes the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, to then say, God, we want your direction, we want more of you, hold on, Holy Spirit. You're the word cousin that we don't want. That's saying, basically, I don't want to worship you, God, because the Holy Spirit is God. Right. See, does that, make, does that kind of make sense? And I feel like part of this is because the cults have emphasized this, and the church kind of picked up on it. For instance, Jehovah's Witness say that, that the Holy Spirit is not a person. He's just the power of God. And the Mormons teach that he's another God, right? He is a God. He's just another God, right? I don't quite remember, so I was hoping you'd bail me out here, but it looks like you don't remember I, either. I, I want to say that, no, that it's more like the power of God. It is? In Mormonism too? I, I, I want to say. I, I don't think it's... Oh, can you? Cool. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so really what we're going to watch out for is is people separating the Trinity into different gods and putting too much of an overemphasis over of one over the other, okay? So with that being said, then another what other people do is they say, well, it's all about the Holy Spirit, right? The, we need to be used of the Holy Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit. And what people do is without Jesus and the Father making it all about the Holy Spirit, instead... They've caused there to be no basis and no doctrine, no stabilizing force for the use of the Holy Spirit. So whereas in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the way that the Holy Spirit is given, but for the purpose of edifying people and how, how, you know, how building up people and not chaotic, but in order and all these different things, the Holy Spirit only people go to the other extreme and say, ah, whatever, as long as it's moved to the Holy Spirit. So they'll gather in for a church service. But no, there'll be no leader. There'll be nothing prepared. They'll just, as the Holy Spirit wills. Mm -hmm. Well, so then their witness is going to be cut down because there's an overemphasis. And then people do this too. They have house churches with, oh, we, we just go there and we just wait for the Holy Spirit to move. And they never grow as Christians. They stay as these immature Christians. And the Holy Spirit eventually stops showing up. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell where there's disunity and discord. Go ahead. I, I, I don't guess he's a god. Um... He, he's just something that bears witness to God. Something that bears witness? Like a sign? Like like an inanimate object? or I don't like, understand. Like, like it's a thing, I guess. But it, not, a, not, not it, God? It's completely separate from God. It's one in, in unity of purpose with God. But so is God. it a God or is it an it? It's not a God. It's just like an entity that was given to us to bear witness to God. Okay, that doesn't make sense to me, but all right. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, so, uh, but then also there's been a group going on that, that, that's, that's called the Jesus Only Movement, and basically there's the idea that since there is one God, that God changes forms, right? There's no distinction between the persons. It's one God that changes forms. The Father changed into the Son for His ministry on Earth, and then He changed into the Holy Spirit. For the church now. But there are three different persons in that one God. Three different distinctions in that one God. They are all fully one God, okay? Jesus is not the same as the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the same as the Father. Does that make sense? Now, this is something that, don't worry if, it, if the Trinity doesn't completely make sense, because, you know, honestly, it's like something that's beyond our understanding. That makes sense. The only reason why we even know that the Trinity exists isn't because. Because the Bible uses the word Trinity. It doesn't ever use the word Trinity. Um, trinity, all that Trinity means is triune. A, 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 a three unified thing. Right? Mm -hmm. So, technically, the spokes of a tire could be a Trinity. Right. By dictionary standards. Okay. So, with that being said, does that kind of make sense? It's something that's, that, that, that the Bible shows but doesn't really give a name for. Some people have have gone to this and gone to the thing, and and I don't really know what my view is on it one way or another, but that we as people are three part beings. We have a soul, a spirit, and a body. 
I don't really have a stance on one way or another. I, I really couldn't care any less, and I already don't care. Um, but basically, those people say, so in the same way that we are three-part beings, we're, we're one person, but we have those three different parts of, of our beings. It's the same way that God is three different parts. But, but, but that still doesn't clarify because the Father is fully God, the same as Jesus is fully God. So all those individual parts of us would have to be fully us. Our spirit would have to be completely us, the same as our flesh would have to be completely us. See what I mean? So it, it falls short of the, of the analogy. Another thing that people say is it's like an egg. Except that the shell is not completely the egg. The shell is a part of the egg. The father is completely God. See what I mean? So it's not something that can be easily explained. There's things that, that, that help us understand. Uh, something? According to uh, Karn... To who? Karn. Okay, yeah, I know the site. <clears throat> Mormonism distinguishes between the Holy Spirit, that is God's presence via an essence, okay, and the Holy Ghost, the third God in the Mormon doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so there's there's two different ones, Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost, and one is a God and one is an essence. Okay, that's just confusing. Right. <laughs> that's just confusing. <clears throat> Anyways, you know, honestly, I think some people just try to confuse themselves. Like, let's just, because why not? <laughs> Anyways, whatever. Um, the Holy Spirit does call attention to himself. Some people say, okay, so the Holy Spirit only does things if it glorifies Jesus Christ. No. The Holy Spirit does do things that calls attention to himself, and he does do things that glorifies Jesus, and he does do things that glorifies the Father. Right? The Holy Spirit is God. And God does things that bring glory to himself. Okay? That make sense? The Holy Spirit is not a lesser God. Okay? The Holy Spirit is God just the same as the Father and Jesus is God. Okay? That makes sense? Sort of? I think one of the reasons why people get it so overemphasized and confused about this is because they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to understand it in a way that you know, humans, you know. Right. They, they don't realize... Right. It's either three or it's one. What are you saying? Right. Like it can't be three and one, but that's exactly what we're saying. It's three and one. I don't think yeah. they understand that we're not meant to understand it, you know. Yeah. I wonder if when we get to heaven we'll actually understand it. Because if so, like, mind blown. Right. We all get to heaven and say, ah, right, okay, got it. It was so easy. <laughs> right. Or if, like, we'll go on for the rest of eternity always learning but never fully understanding. I wonder. Mm. Anyways. <clears throat> so John 16, 14 talks about the way that the Holy Spirit... Okay, and I'm going to read this because I think that this does need to be emphasized. The Holy Spirit does... And here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit moves, God will be glorified. The Holy Spirit is not going to move in such a way that God is not glorified. Does that make sense? Right. And so to then say... Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't have to draw attention. The Holy Spirit doesn't have to uh, only glorify Jesus, you know, so that means that he can just do whatever. Well, no. So John 16, uh, 14 says, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and de declare it to you. But notice that Jesus is not saying he will glorify me and only me. Okay. Sometimes we put words in the Holy Spirit that didn't happen. So, uh, Acts 2, 2 through 3 talks about this as well. This is real quickly. We're just going to plow through the rest of it, I think, because I think you guys got, got the idea. Um, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. The Holy Spirit here is revealing of himself without it pointing to Jesus. However, God is still glorified, just doesn't point only to Jesus. Okay, so once again, balance in, the, in these things, okay? The Holy Spirit is not going to move in such a way that contradicts the Bible. The Holy Spirit is not going to move in such a way that doesn't glorify God. Okay? Um, so I hope that that made sense. Really hope that that made sense because we get a lot of questions around the, about this. Okay, so if you didn't understand it, and you don't have any questions right now, go back throughout the week and listen to it. And listen to it a couple of times. And then think about it. And then for, and then write down your questions so you don't forget. And then ask it. Okay? Because I, I really want to make sure that we're all clear on this. Um, 
What should we not seek from the Holy Spirit because of the time? I'm just going to plow through this, guys. Tests. We shouldn't test the Lord by means of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving, so so I'm going to prove the power of God. Uh, Chuck, stand up and be healed. I'm proving, you see what I mean? Did God tell me, hey, I'm going to heal Chuck, and I want you to go pray for him? No. I just, I think we're going to do that, and it'll prove the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because this is what people do. I have to just will myself into, into the Holy Spirit moving. If I have enough faith, if I believe it hard enough, if I think of something, then the Holy Spirit will do it. God, I believe this is this is you, and this will be a prophecy to you. Uh, hold on, are you making a prophecy up on the spot? Because that's not a prophet. Right. This is a self-proclaimed prophet, and God strongly warns against that. If God says this on the other hand, go and tell this person that thing and say this. Look, I think the, I, I think that God is telling me to tell you this, and then have a dialogue with them. Does that sound like something that the Lord's been working with you on, or right. what do you think? You see what I mean? Like, don't just do drive-by evangelism. Yeah. The Holy Spirit said this by. Do what? Yeah, and like you said earlier, a lot of times it won't be something that will catch that person off guard. Yeah. It'll be something God's already been dealing with. Them yeah. About and, now. and if you say it as a friend, so I mean, if you know the person, you just say it as a friend, it'll be easier to receive. And also, if you say it in a calmer tone, yeah. they'll be more willing to listen to whatever it is you're saying. Hey, jerk. God says to stop doing that. It's it's stupid. Stop wasting your money, jerk. Well, obviously he's not going to listen to what I'm saying. Come on. Uh, Mark 16, 17 through 18 is a verse that, said, that, that um, says basically that, that, that Jesus' disciples will, will handle snakes and tree poison and all these different things and not die. And there's a few things that I want to say. First off, this is a verse that wasn't really in the oldest of manuscripts, okay? In fact, if you'll turn with me in your Bible, it'll say this little note in it, okay? Mark. It's the very end of the, uh, end of the chapter, okay? And it says this. Some manuscripts insert... Uh, oh, wait, no, hold on. Wrong spot. Okay, right here. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Which is the the the, the ending here, uh, the whole last part here of Mark, and then here at the bottom it also has something uh, that says this: um, some manuscripts include after verse eight the following, and it says a little verse here, and then goes on to, and then it says, and then it continues in verse nine. So there are three endings to Mark. One ends in verse eight, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The second ending is one that has this footnote at the bottom. Um, but they reported briefly to Peter and those with them all that they had been told. And after this, Jesus himself sent out by means of, the, of them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. And then it goes on to verse 19. And then the third ending that it has, it doesn't have that thing that I just read. It goes straight to 9 and finishes up with verse 20. But the earliest manuscripts don't have those endings on it, which means there's probably added. Okay. Now what that means for us... Go ahead and read it like it's part of Scripture, okay? But don't base doctrine off of it unless it's validated in the rest of Scripture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because it's a disputed part. And God is not going to teach a doctrine such as you should handle a snake. You should let it bite you. Go ahead. See what happens. <laughs> you shouldn't have that as doctrine no, unless no, no. it can be validated by Scripture. And God's going to say that quite a few times. Hey, I want you to go get bit by snakes. Go ahead. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. See what I mean? But what people have done is they've taken this and they've built a doctrine off of this. This is what it actually says, okay, in verse 17. Um, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, speak in, to in tongues, pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Um, a, he's not saying every single time. Okay, these, these sorts of things, okay. He's not giving an exhaustive list. These things every believer will do. He's saying these sorts of things will accompany those, right? We see this in Acts when Paul is bit by a very poisonous viper and it does not die. An example of that. Now, did every believer in the early church bit by a, bit by a poisonous snake survive? No. We have one case of that happening and the person surviving. That's not worth building a doctrine off of. Okay? Um, and so these things are, once again, kind of blown out, blown out of proportion. We don't need to test the Lord. If we are doing the work of the Lord and we are bit by a poisonous snake, 
Nowadays, we should probably go to the doctor anyways. But God is completely capable of healing you as well. But you should probably still go to the doctor. Right. Just throwing that out there. If you drink poison, probably should go to the doctor. Okay. You should definitely pray, and ultimately God will take your life if he's ready for you to go. Mm -hmm. That's just something we have to be okay with. Um, but with that being said, we don't need to test the Lord. Lord, I want to see if I have enough faith in you. Chuck, go give me some poison. <laughs> That's not really what it's saying there. Okay. It's like where we try to self-fulfill prophecy. This prophecy is given, so I need to fulfill it. No, the prophecy was given because it will be fulfilled. Not because you need to make it be fulfilled, but because it is going to be fulfilled. Chuck is going to, Chuck is going to go out that door later. Uh, he's not going to now go out that door because I said that that's something he's going to do. That's because he needs to go out that door to get back to his car. See what I mean? So, I hope that that made sense. Um... Being slain in the Spirit, another thing we do not need to seek the Holy Spirit for, okay? This is what people have made, made a practice of doing. We are seeking to be slain in the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing, guys. There is no biblical evidence of people needing to seek after being slain in the Holy Spirit. There is biblical evidence of people being slain in the Spirit, okay? But not because they were seeking after that thing. This is something we like to call an effect of being in God's presence, you don't need to seek an effect of being in God's presence. You need to seek God's presence. You just understand the difference? We're seeking God's kingdom, right? That's what Jesus said in Matthew, right? Seek first the kingdom of God, not seek first to be slain in the spirit. Mm. And so what people have done is they've made very, very weird things go on because we're just wanting to see the Holy Spirit move. So, and so then what people got, got started doing is fake things, and I'll tell you about this in a second. And what this really comes from is a spirit of greed, honestly, is what it is. I want, I want, not God, use me as you will. I want more of you, God. I want this. And then there got to be this attitude where there's superior Christians who are slain in the spirit, and the rest of you all peons that, that weren't slain in the spirit because you're just not spiritual enough. Uh -huh. See what I mean? Now we've got two classes of people, and now that spirit of greed is really going crazy because it's like, yes, yes, I'm being exalted beyond these hooligans. Finally, God has seen my potential, and I am miles ahead of these guys. See what I mean? And I'm not talking about a spirit dwelling inside of you. I'm talking about that desire that is inherently in yourself to be greedy. Um, another one is is uh, fame. We shouldn't seek the Holy Spirit for fame. We see this in two different places in Acts. Chapter 5 talks about two people, Ananias and Sapphira, who tried to get fame by selling their position, possessions. Except, nope, they only gave a fraction of it to the church and claimed to give them all of it so that they could get the fame of that. The second one is in Acts chapter 8, where there's a man called Simon who's a sorcerer, or uh, yeah, I believe that's what his name is. And he was used to doing all these things and all the tension on himself. And I encourage you to go read that passage for yourself. And, and, and Luke draws special attention to that fact. That he used to do all kinds of things. He was he, he says that he told people how great he was. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so then he saw the, the disciples being used. And he said, I will give you money. Give me that. So that I can do that too. And he tried to get fame from, from it. Once again, we don't need, to get the, we don't need the Holy Spirit for fame. Um, we need the Holy Spirit because we need the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen the Holy Spirit used in a way that caused more harm than good? And I'll give you an example. I was at a church, and there was someone I know that, that, that went up for prayer, to, for prayer, uh, and he was one of those people who, who came to do the whole, come pray and you'll be uh, uh, slain in the Spirit. Okay? So he would go, and Zach, come here, sing, okay? He would go, and then we have you stand in a straight line, and you know he, he's got the special holy hands, right? So he'd pray, and he'd you know, do his little chant and everything, and have oil on his hands, and then he'd go like this. And as he did that, you better fall back. Right. Don't fall back. Fall back. See what I mean? And if you didn't, he'd do it again until you fell back. <laughs> so finally this guy, um, the, the bassist, um, used to always stand behind people so if they were slain in the spirit but weren't really slain in the spirit, he could guide them down instead of them smacking their heads. So, <laughs> Pastor talked about that too. People who, you know, ah! It's like, okay, if you're slain in the spirit, A, God can cover you, God can protect you from harm. And B, anyways, you don't really have to worry about your fall. But anyways, so he, he would do that because he knew that a lot of people would fake things. And uh, so finally he just whispered in the person's ear. He said, just 
Just, just go ahead. He's not gonna stop until you just yeah. j- just fall back, so he'll go away, and then, then we'll <laughs> then we'll move on, okay? Uh, so he does it again, and, and the person pretending to fall back, so the guy would leave him alone. You see what I mean? Because God wasn't being holy. God wasn't being glorified. He needed a certain amount of people being slain in the spirit for his ministry to say, "Hey, look at how many people have been slain in the spirit." Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? God wasn't being glorified. They were seeking being slain in the spirit because that's the most spiritual thing. Nothing to do with witnessing, nothing to do with people being saved, right? Nothing to do with our growth. Do you understand the difference? Okay? So this is not uh, this is something that causes more causes more harm than good. We have room for just a, a, a few stories. Does can anybody uh, does anybody have have a similar occurrence that happened to them? Uh, I I'm not going to say when where how it happened to me. I I think um they just waited a long time with me for me to be filled with the spirit, mm-hmm. and I think they were like pushing. It, it was too pushy, mm-hmm. and I was getting more irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. Wow. I have personally been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't even focus on God because I was so irritated. I couldn't wait for them to just leave me alone, <laughs> and I just never went there no yeah. more. No. I'm like uh, I'm. Yeah. yeah. No, I have experienced that, and I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> the feeling where you're trying to seek after God, this is something new, you really you really want it, but then there's always those people who get around you. For me, it was like these two or three like elderly women, and they had rancid breath, and they was all up in my business. Uh, Say these words after me. Okay? I mean, whatever. Uh, and then, you know... Uh, <laughs> God will fill you with the Holy Spirit tonight, right now. It makes you feel bad because then you wonder, is it you? Yeah. Right. Or, uh, it's yeah. like there's something wrong with me. Why yeah. am I not getting this? You know. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> You're not saved enough. <laughs> it it kind of gets you to that point. Yeah. I'm like, am I not worthy enough? I'm like, what's going on here? You know. Yeah. And I'm like, oh heck with it. I, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. My favorite thing is when. It's at a very dead church, and they, they, they don't want to believe that they're a dead church. Mm-hmm. So they think that just by going up in prayer and just demanding of the Holy Spirit to fill people, that they're just going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's like, well, it doesn't really work like that, guys. <laughs> but anyways, uh, any other any other stories of, of how do I word this? The Holy Spirit used in a way that caused more harm than good? Um, it didn't happen to me. It happened to a pastor person I knew. Uh-huh. Um, they were at a youth camp. And uh, somebody came up to him and said, hey, this person's demon possessed. And so they took him back to his <laughs> room, and they were casting the demon out of him, and it turns out the kid was just um, mentally handicapped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so awkward. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so awkward. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> Where's the back door? I need to just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Once they realize it, they're like, oh, crap. <laughs> They got an ugly, ugly letter from that kid's parents. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Uh, but do you see? I'm surprised they didn't get sued. Right. <laughs> right. Do, do you see how the how the, how it's just different when when the Lord's been glorified and when there's not? You see what I mean? Yeah. So, we're gonna move ahead. Anything else anybody wanna say? No. I'm moving ahead. So what the Holy Spirit is not, I'm gonna I'm gonna go pretty fast through this because, like I said, I am keeping you guys a little late. It's already eight five. Uh, manipulating God, you know, the Holy Spirit is not manip- manipulating God. We don't do certain chants and prayers. Perfect. We, we don't do certain works that, that that have perfected us to where God will will listen to us. Because if we're good enough, the Holy Spirit will move, right? See what I mean? Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't manipulate God in the way that. Um, you know, uh, they're at odds with each other, and so the Holy Spirit has to like convict the Father of of being good to us. You know what I mean? Like we get these ideas that there's just this 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 separation that just doesn't exist. Um, the Holy Spirit is also not unbiblical. The Holy Spirit will not contradict Scripture ever. He will not do something that is blatantly against His Word. God always acts according to His character, and the Holy Spirit, requ- the 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 Scripture, the Scriptures record that God's Spirit and God's Spirit doesn't change. 
So, uh, the Holy Spirit is not forcing an outcome. We already talked about this. You will be healed. You're going to be healed. That's just it. I, I'm going to go and I'm going to... I'm going to, you know, pray for this, and that's just going to happen. It's like, well, once again, you can pray for people, but unless the Holy Spirit specifically says, I'm going to heal that person, then maybe you should be patient. And you should probably only tell people that the Holy Spirit told you somebody is going to be saved if he specifically tells you to, because a lot of times what people will do is they'll say, the Holy Spirit revealed this to me. And it actually wasn't the Holy Spirit at all. It was just you wanted something really, really bad, and so you convinced yourself there was the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't, though. <laughs> so be very careful with this guys um, only used by the best in Acts 8 14 through 17 it records um, the, there's just these people here who, who hadn't been baptized yet and so Paul goes and, and they pray together and they're filled with the Holy Spirit it says that they didn't know they didn't know the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet they'd only been baptized in the name of Jesus they, they didn't know that there was the 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 feeling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't know that was a thing. So Paul goes and prays with them, and, and there's, there's nothing <coughs> set apart from them. They're, they're, they're just these believers over here that want to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's it. So it's really something, it's not just for the best of us, it's it's for the church. And I think that Joel kind of clarified that too. Joel. Um, it's also not something decided by the individual. We'll talk about this next week when we talk about the gifts. But... I'm declaring myself a prophet. It, it doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? And a lot of people have done th things like this and have said things like this, and that's just not really how it works. And also, just because the Holy Spirit has used you in something once doesn't mean he will forever. Okay? Let's say God, for instance, tells Chuck to tell Gracie something. That would technically, technically be uh, probably a, a prophetic word. Right? Mm -hmm. However, let's say that he never, ever tells Chuck for the rest of his life to say something to anybody else. Never once uses him in, in, in prophecy ever again. So, I mean, that can happen. Because Chuck didn't decide to be a prophet. The Holy Spirit told him to do something, and he obeyed. See? So you have to watch out for this. It's not decided by the individual. We don't declare ourselves something. I want to. I want to have the gift. Of, uh, the gift of the Holy. I want to have the gift of healing. I, I've looked through this catalog here. I want that one. It's not like that. You know, I, I want the gift of healing, so I'm just going to have the gift of healing. What? No, we are used according to the Spirit who wills it. And 1 Corinthians 12, 11 uh, says that, so I'm not really going to read that because we're already out of time. Um, and so I, this is the question of the week. I brought this up two weeks ago. I went and talked to Pastor about it. I uh, did some study on it myself, and, and I, really feel like I, I really feel like I have a handle on the issue. Um, so I will we'll talk about that next week. But uh, I would like love to hear your guys' opinions. Um, are there other gifts besides those mentioned in First Corinthians twelve? That's a question.